Good morning. I'm Father Austin on this Sunday, going going live today for you from the rectory, from our house. I hope you all are well, and I hope you can hear me. You can watch it. You can watch live alongside me, and I'm going to. We'll start our worship shortly. I hope everybody is warm and safe on this cold, cold Sunday, this last day after the Epiphany, what we call the Transfiguration. And as always, we'll begin with a morning meditation. And then go into the service. Let us prepare for worship together. The Lord, the God of gods, has spoken. He has called the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God reveals himself in glory. Our God will come and not keep silence. Before him there is a consuming flame, and round about him a raging storm. He calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of his people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me, and sealed it with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare the rightness of his cause, for God himself will judge. A reading from the second book of Kings. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. For the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elisha said to him, Elisha, stay here. For the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, A chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into pieces. Here ends the reading. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. 
Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became a dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them any more, only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had been risen from the dead. Here ends the reading. I speak to you in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I've had a real difficulty over the past year finding my way to the mountaintops. We've all tried to go about doing what we can do with what we are given, and it's been exhausting. Undoubtedly, each of us at some point or another have been shown both our best and worst during this pandemic. But hearing this story today brings us back to the summit again. And it's good for us to be here, as Peter says. Today we come to the revelation, what we call the transfiguration on top of the mountain. And it seems both refreshing to hear and also as far-fetched as starting an Episcopal Diocese of the Moon. This event is, among many other things, about hope. That there is a hope that God's work among us will succeed. That the transforming power of the love of God will take on evil and challenge it and expose it and transform it. We can all picture the story as it happens to, to every detail. The loyalty of the disciples to climb up with Jesus to that spot. That experience of awe and fear of the storm overhead and the voice that is speaking. And then there is the detail of the clothes, the white of those robes. In the days before washing machines, and especially among ordinary working people, the whiteness of laundry was a sign of being respectable. Sparkling laundry was, at one time, an outward and visible sign of accomplishment for one who was able to have the whitest and brightest of the bunch. And they did it without the use of bleach. Nowadays, we certainly have plenty of other ways to, mar to mark our success, don't we? Nonetheless, in the story, we are told that Jesus' clothing becomes dazzling white. Dazzling. It makes me think of another part of the story, how the end of Mark goes. On entering the tomb... They saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe, and there they were utterly amazed. He said to them, Do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. In our house, it was Dad, who was the one who cared for our clothes. 
You can never have too many white dress shirts, he would say. He cared for them, and still does care for clothes with a passion. He rarely uses the dryer because of the worry of shrinking or ruining clothes. He made a clothesline out of an old zip line that my brother and I played with in the backyard. And I think about him clipping those shirts on the line and taking the time and care. And then the image of these clothes blowing in the wind. I admit I was enabled when it, became, when it came to doing laundry. Though I don't know if my dad would have had it, had it any other way if I had asked to help. One of my greatest discoveries in my first year at Ole Miss was Rainbow Laundry, who offered a fluff and fold service, thanks be to God. Even today, well, I admit, if my spouse is listening, I do not do the laundry very often. And I certainly don't put the time and care to make my clothes dazzle. And so many of us wouldn't make that connection with this detail of clothes in the story. Yet, I imagine those who put the same care as my dad, or maybe our brothers and sisters working in laundry mats or in clothing stores or whoever it is in our homes that puts great love and care into it. I wonder if they would recognize that detail of how those garments would mark some work that they put into it, that they put into it. That there is time and energy needed, some wear and tear on the body to make it happen. Those dazzling garments on the mountain may not have been transformed by human hands, but as a result of, an, of a labor of love still, God's labor of love. This is what Jesus is all about. Jesus teaches and heals, travels from a place to another. He gets tired along the way, surely. And the labor of love takes a toll on the body. Jesus must be tired and frightened when he travels down into the world, as the disciples are now. As they witness the change of his appearance and the dazzling. And it would be much easier to stay there. On that summit. In the warm presence of God. But hearing the story today is a reminder that that is not where the work is. Jesus is scared to go down. But he must. He will go to Jerusalem to confront those in power to those who will not hand over their power so easily. They certainly won't give it up to somebody who tries to show power not through violence, but through love. And so Jesus was and is a threat, and threats must be destroyed. As in the laundry, Jesus will do the work. He'll do the work of love that refuses to play the world's power games of whatever kind. Jesus will labor in love to denounce any kind of law made to oppress or exclude someone. Jesus will do the work of a nonviolent way of love to show the way, the way of healing and even eternal life. And the work of one person for the well-being of all will have a complete wear and tear of the body all the way to death. In our culture, white speaks to purity. Weddings, baptism, sure. 
And the Bible White speaks to the promise of a time where everything will be clean and cared for and beautiful and complete. A time where everyone will know and proclaim that they are embraced and robed in God's own self. Where nothing is hidden and there isn't anything left to hide. Heaven, perhaps. It's the place where, like Moses, Jesus encounters God. Where he is blessed and embraced for the final part of his journey. Now it's the place where Jesus is the most himself. And for all who are there to experience it. Moses had received the law. Like Elijah who spoke the will of God to the world. Now it's Jesus' turn. And it happens right in the middle between baptism and resurrection. Right in the middle of the journey of discipleship. You know, it's easy really to talk about our feelings of what we get out of church or the ministries that we share. Or we think too often of what we're doing only when it comes to the self. What do I want? What do I need from this place? This year we've all been reminded of another side of our faith. The lament side. Wandering in the wilderness where trauma is without a clear end in sight. Although it's coming. And today's story and vivid image of what we call the transfiguration happens because Jesus exercises his faith not for his own satisfaction, but through the simple love of God. And such love is not just a feeling, it's an attitude, it's a discipline. We can't learn to do laundry by allowing someone else to do it any more than we can grow in faith through a lukewarm practice. Peter, James, and John choose to follow. And they, like Jesus, will lead others to descend towards Jerusalem. They, like Jesus, will embark on that final journey to the cross and to the silent tomb beyond. They don't know what's happening right now, but they do know they want to be there. And in the end, they will follow this Jesus of Nazareth, and they will learn that same discipline before the end. As will we. In Lent, which is almost upon us, and in some say maybe we haven't even left Lent, this season is about hope. That there is a hope that something really is happening at last. And it's time for us to prepare for it. Ash Wednesday gives us a chance to descend, to come down from ourselves. We will come to confess, we'll hold ourselves and the church accountable, and we will be reminded of how fragile life is. But we will follow Jesus nonetheless, descend with him. And we will claim that there is more to life than dog eat dog finishing with the most wins in this life. And that we exercise our discipline of faith. We will do the laundry. We will make the tattered, broken, the colorless garments of this world shining white through the grace of God. We will do the work and follow and reject greed and selfishness, which seems to be in front of us every second of every day. And we'll follow Jesus and be love, though we will stumble all the time. Yes, it's good for us to be here. It's good for us to worship on Sundays. 
It's good for us to read scripture. It's good for us to come to the table. But that's not where the work is. The work is following the one who came into the world down the mountain to see where they will lead us. We will travel with them to Jerusalem so that on that Easter day, we too can wear that garment. That garment that human hands have made. The same garment that's given to us at our baptism, we already have it. Take a chance and wear it. It might just transform us. It might just transform the world. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. We pray for all who can escape the elements today. We pray for our parish family, for DJ, Deanne, Edgar, Hardy, Harriet, Jan, Jerry, Joe, Ivy Jane, Milo Joseph, Jackson, Mike, Norma, Peggy, Scott, Scott, and William. We pray for those in our senior living communities, Dixie, Joyce, Linda, Laura, Mary, and Nita. We pray for our extended family and friends as listed in our bulletin. We pray for those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week, Rob and Connie Arline, Lillian, Norma, Chris and Julie, Rosalind and Adrian. We pray for those serving in the armed forces, for all who serve overseas and their families. We continue to give thanks for those who serve in harm's way in health care. We pray for our Bishop Brian and clergy of this diocese. We pray for our work and our rest and our play. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And with the words Jesus Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from a time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins. and Give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, friends, life is short, and we don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel this journey with us. So be quick to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you. Always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.